Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Prabir, and uh, also uh, good afternoon to everybody in this uh, conference. Uh, for past two days, we have been talking about this Indo-Pacific strategy, but it has a different meaning to different people. So it has a different narratives, and I would like to bring in uh, one connectivity program that can bring uh, two securities. One is that is energy security to the region. Second is the climate security. So I will see that is how, how this ASEAN is progressing in this uh, power connectivity and uh, what are the some of the challenges uh, that could be uh, harnessed through the regional cooperation that need some hard decisions. Uh, this is a kind of an aspiration of these uh, ASEAN citizens. Uh, basically, the study was conducted in 2016 as a part of uh, ASEAN 50 study. And if you look, and most of the ASEAN citizens, uh, by 2025, they wanted to live in a much cleaner environment. And by 2025, they also uh, need to address this uh, ever-increasing challenges of the climate change and the natural disasters. So this natural disasters, and also yes, yes, in the case of pandemic, uh, is, is happening and, and we, we, we need to develop a resilient system. So this resilient system could also become in the form of uh, new connectivities. So I will be talking about this uh, one connectivity that is a power sector connectivity. Uh, <coughs> Many of you know this, this uh, graph or this, this figure, which is a very famous. Uh, this is a kind of ASEAN power grid connectivity uh, that uh, sees uh, kind of a, a trade flow, that is the energy trade flow across these boundaries. Some countries, this trade flow is happening uh, uh, in two ways, and some countries it one way. But what is more important here is uh, by having this connectivity, it starts with the bilateral and then moving to the trilateral, and then finally it goes to the multilateral. By having this connectivity, we will be harnessing the full potentials of the renewable energy, which is, has been abandoned in this region. And by this, uh, we will be taking this uh, future of our economy into a low carbon. That means uh, we'll be in a better position to achieve this uh, Paris climate targets. Here is the, comes these um, opportunities for the Indo-Pacific. This is about the ASEAN. And if you see this figure on the, on the uh, right hand side, you can see that is, it could be easily extended to include India and also Australia, which is proposing a new type of connectivity within Indonesia and then it is extended to Japan, that is in the East Asia. Basically, the aim or the vision is uh, having uh, that Asian power grid uh, uh, had embedded into an Asian great power grid. Why this uh, power connectivity or the cross-border trade occurs? And there are uh, five rationales. The first thing is um, there are difference in the energy resources and environments relative to the demand. For example, in Thailand has a uh, more demand, but uh, limited resource endorsement. So this trade flow from uh, Laos uh, happen. And there is also difference in the timing of the peak load as, as we can see from the Malaysia and the Thailand because of these time differences. And there are also locational factors that favor the cross-border connectivity. In this case of, um, Lao and Thailand and Myanmar and uh, uh, this, this cross-border connectivity and also this is linking with the Vietnam. Basically, these locational factors where this supply and demand could be matched by this uh, cross-border connectivity is an important factor. And the fourth rationale is this economics of the scale. For example, this region is uh, endowed with this uh, lot of renewable resources. By making this connectivity, we can see that is, there is no need for the new power plant that depends upon the fossil fuels. So that means there is an avoided, for example, coal power plants in the future, if this connectivity happened. 
And the fourth one is this energy security. And uh, in this region, except uh, Brunei, almost all the countries are net exporters of uh, energy. So this connectivity improve that energy security are more mostly, they become more uh, reliance, self-reliance on this uh, use of this energy uh, resources and the diversification of the supply that happened within the region. And uh, the final most important thing is uh, all the countries has committed to 2030 tar targets that has to be met by this uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Now, this net zero emissions are, uh, the talks and these uh, discussions on the net zero emissions has been already happening. So this uh, uh, co-benefit of uh, climate change and the energy security is a kind of a basic rational, economic rationally for going for this power grid connectivity as well as the cross-border energy trade. So this shows kind of a net benefits and the net cost. On the left-hand side, you can see this is the net cost of this uh, uh, power interconnectivity. If you see that is these uh, different interconnectivities, Laos, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and Singapore, by connecting these uh, four economies uh, through power uh, interconnectivity and uh, uh, facilitating the energy trade, we could be able to gain about um, uh, 4,000 a million US dollars. On the, on the left, on the right hand side, you can see this is the kind of environmental benefits. How much these carbon emission reductions could be done that ranges from about 100 million gigatons of carbon dioxide over the period of uh, uh, 2025, about 10 year period. And this will basically help these uh, countries not to go for other fossil fuel investments. But, uh, you know, that is the, the difficulty comes in when, when talking about this uh, interconnectivity. And this interconnectivity will has to be happen by FDIs, by the investors, and also the financing community. But uh, when we ask, uh, this is the where that is the real difficult comes in. If you ask that investors, what could be the barriers for this uh, investing in this uh, cross-border connectivity? We, we easily identified four barriers and it cut across the ASEAN and ASEAN plus three countries and as well as ASEAN plus six countries that include uh, India, Australia, and Japan. Here, most of these investors See, there is a complex procedures in getting this connectivity projects get funded. And also there is a changing in the policies. Some countries, uh, actually every day, it is a kind of a new policy environment when coming to this uh, integration of the renewables and as well as the inviting these uh, investments in the power sector, which has been dominated by state-owned enterprises. A second set of constraints, we found uh, this kind of investments take longer recovery period. That means some guarantee systems is needed. This guarantee could be coming from the national governments or it could be coming from the multilateral development agencies like World Bank or ADB. When this insufficient credit and the maturity is also found to be a major problem in the ASEAN plus three and ASEAN plus six, most of these investments will be coming from this uh, ASEAN plus three and as well as ASEAN plus six countries. There is also market uh, risk. There is a, uh, now it is, uh, we have been discussing about the digital uh, technologies and also this technology advancements risk. Basically, this technology is moving very fast. The investors are also worrying about the uncertainties in investing in these uh, new technologies, which may, lose the merit or which may lose the competitiveness in the short term period. So these are the kind of uh, major uh, hurdles based by the investment communities to investment in the cross-border connectivity projects. This has been illustrated by 
this table, you can see that is the, how much this uh, domestic investment is happening in the energy sector. Here, it has been growing in almost all countries, in India, China, and ASEAN countries. But if you come into this cross-border energy investments, we could be able to see only two major junks of um, investment. Uh, that is related to lower PDR, where that is the uh, ADB as I can bring in some kind of collateral. And another is the Myanmar, this uh, cross-border uh, power trade, uh, connecting this Myanmar and China, where this is most of the investments are coming from um, China. So this is the hard reality, where each country is uh, promoting uh, energy investments to achieve this national energy security but the investment that is coming into the cross-border energy connectivity that can facilitate this cross-border energy trade is very much limited. This could be due to some of this um, existing non-alignment of these national priorities and the regional aspirations. Here, this is the, here we need a perfect balance between the national responsibilities. And then when we see ASEAN think about it, it has to deliver its regional responsibilities. So it cannot become a kind of simply remain as a kind of aspirational targets. This APG has been existing for the past 15 years. There is a progress, but the progress is not happening at this level that is at the level as well as the speed it is needed. This is mainly to, uh, due to this uh, uh, developing the national framework conditions, where most of the countries basically see it as a kind of uh, energy sector development plans. Basically, that is the energy sector development plans is aligned with this uh, uh, investment in this uh, uh, grid. But uh, they fail to give a proper market design that involves more uh, input from the other sectoral ministries, like uh, this industry ministries, as well as the finance ministries, which has to be taken into consideration. Here, it cannot be a player for only one sector. Here, we need a much more uh, cross-border or the cross-sectoral coordinations. This is similar to that is establishing the tariffs. Many countries in this region has been promoting renewable portfolio standards and the renewable energy targets that has been uh, helping these countries to absorb more renewable energies. I think at present it is about 15% uh, of the total energy, but still we have the total capacity of 25%. So it needs uh, more refining the tariff systems and bringing the more stability to these tariff systems to these investors as well as the consumers. And third one is also harmonization of the standards. That has to start first with these uh, security standards and also grid codes then it has to be first synchronized at the bilateral level and then at the national level. So that need ASEAN plus uh, to come together and also to work beyond their comfort zone. That needs a coordinated planning. The coordinated planning can happen at the intersectoral level, at the intercountry level, and also involving uh, other partners, development partners. Like, like Australia and India. And also there is some participation of the external resources in the power systems. That means the new investments that could be coming from these uh, new sources of finance. Like for example, developing a new fiscal instruments like uh, green bond, project-based green bonds or the uh, program-based green bonds or mobilization of these uh, ESG investments. There is a plenty of resources available and they are waiting to be get investor, but we don't have this kind of uh, right policies at the ASEAN level to see it as a kind of a one whole market. And third one is the difficulty part where some of these negotiations has been failed under this uh, tripartite uh, agreement is the how to allocate the transmission cost. For example, if Thailand is uh, exporting that uh, uh, power that is bought from Laos to Singapore and uh, Myanmar means who is going to bear this transmission cost. 
here we need to be very sensitive and it has to have a kind of a fair sharing and that need more uh, coordination cooperation and the collaboration third one is on the, the last one is the harmonization of the standards and the grid codes this this is the kind of uh, challenge and that could be easily met over a period of uh, five to six years than if you started uh, discussions on it and uh, basically this 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 national currently most of the effort is focusing on this national delivering the national responsibilities and this national responsibilities have to be fine tuned with these uh, regional responsibilities thank you dr anbu maybe uh, in okay. uh, one minute time if you can okay this is thank my you. Uh, last slide and so uh, what 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 we know about is this regional power grid interconnectivity can help resolve this energy dilemma of the asean it brings the economic growth energy security and the decarbonization but uh, the, we need to acknowledge this cross border connectivity is a function of the markets and also the trust developed by the national governments and then the implementation need to consider the relevant uh, policy innovations so as a, as a think tank and uh, under, under the uh, indo pacific strategy we 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 talk lo very loud but we can be pragmatic by focusing on what is what could be uh, strengthen this um, asean outlook on the indo pacific if this means there is uh, three areas where we can start one is help the asean and the northeastern states of india to establish a voluntary principles on monitoring guidelines for integration of this power grid connectivity and this uh, uh, facilitation of the trade flow second thing is use the existing institutional frameworks to develop a comprehensive investment road map to address this current existing barriers and finally india australia and asean which is very much in the part of this uh, indo pacific can earmark some of the public funding resources that target for the power market integration it has to leverage the private investments with clear policy signals and for backing the paris agreement this paris agreement has provided a lot of opportunities for innovation and the experimentation i stop here thank you very much okay. Thank you, Dr. Ranbu. Excellent. Uh, so many food for thought, and you have also given us an action plan. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, 